here. Uh, as many of you know, I, I suffered some uh, nerve damage a couple of years ago, which uh, severely incapacitated the use of my left hand. So when I had the need to build a whole bunch of these things, this is a, a square grouper that I make for a niece of mine that operates a restaurant by the same name down in the Keys. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen or heard the story, I've got the story written up up here. You're welcome to stop by and read it, but it's uh, basically uh, the square grouper is a euphemism for uh, a bale of marijuana floating in the water, <laughs> <laughs> of which there's uh, plenty of them down in the Keys. Uh, but anyway, let me hook up my uh, air source here. I can complete this demo. Okay, everybody else is here. Air source. I'll be tomorrow. this uh, gel get lined up on the camera there. What this contraption does is I spear this uh, spear this thing. The way I, I made it for the first iteration was I had a fixture that you'd set this thing in place and it would locate the, uh, the points, intersection points for this uh, string tie and I would put a couple of nails in there. So uh, that took quite a bit of time to you know, flip that thing over and over and grab it, and then you had to remove the nails afterwards, and it was just really slow. So what I did is I came up with this contraption here where I just loop the string around and around. Things on the other side. Yeah. I use this spring hook here to hook that through. standing in front of this thing so it's a lot faster. Then I drive a staple in there that holds everything in place so I'm ready to take one of these tails, insert that in there, and then I can take the staples loose. Then uh, once I'm done with that part, I now no longer need my locator points here and ready to move on to the next stage. Production rate. Uh, well, I got about 200 of these things to do. I can do. Uh, I can do probably about five or six an hour. You know, by the time uh, you get done putting eyes and tails and the, uh, the mouth and all that kind of part on there. Hmm. What's the going rate for a square group? Uh, <laughs> I think by 20 years. <laughs> All depends on who catches you with it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the story behind the thing is that uh, I first made a dozen of these things for my uh, niece for just for decoration around the restaurant. She was afraid they'd get stolen because uh, 
piracy is still alive and well down in the Southern Keys. And uh, so she put them, she took them, you know, out of the restaurant and put them back there behind the bar so that uh, they would be up there for display. Mm -hmm. And several of the customers were just really insistent on the fact that they just had to have one. Mm -hmm. And finally, one night when she wasn't there and her husband was tending the bar, uh, comes this, uh, this one guy who happened to be a narc, you know, narcotics agent from the local area, and he plopped down 40 bucks and says, I'm taking that one. You got a problem with that? <laughs> and uh, her husband, being the prudent sort, and not wanting to argue with somebody that carries a gun, he, he decided that <laughs> $40 sounded like a fair price. <laughs> So that kind of opened the floodgates. She, she sold the other 11 in short order and called me up and said, any chance of you making any more of those? So mm. This is uh, about the third or fourth generation of me, uh, me making these things. So that's, that's kind of the story behind this fixture. Another one that's- around, would you? Hmm? Would you pass a grouper around? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to see the fixture. They want to see the grouper. <laughs> Anybody got a gun in here? You can buy it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass the uh, grouper and the story around with it there. The, uh, the other fixture that I brought with me is I do a fair amount of flat work and uh, frequently have to uh, join flat panels that you want to keep the things together and level and even. So I was constantly finding myself uh, measuring for what size biscuit would fit in a in a given location so after uh, making a few mistakes and so forth i decided to make up this gauge here uh, marked with the you know the size of the biscuit down at the bottom the <coughs> that the biscuit goes in uh, measured to thousandths of an inch so ken yeah. vickery would be proud of that and uh, measured to the tenth of an inch on the width so that I could do the layout, you know, kind of on the fly with the uh, particular piece that I was that I was laying out. Any questions on that? All right, I think with, uh, with that, we'll move on to this next fixture over here. If you'd uh, come up and tell us a little bit about what appears to be a steady rest to me. Well, yep. Yeah. It is. It's a cheap man's steady rest. Bit of uh, Delta Mini slave. I got I was on the web one day and found a picture of it. And they also had a PDF file with it was made. Uh, the first <coughs> big problem I found out after after cutting it that the distance from the top of the blade to the center point of a hole was about an inch and a quarter short <laughs> from their diagram. They called for a 10 by 10 form to be able to do it. So I had to correct that. Uh, I found these wheels down at uh, Harbor Freight. They might be better if they had ball bearings in them rather than uh, just friction of going around on the, you know, the bolts. Um, it vibrates a lot, so it was it was it was enjoyable to build, but I'm not sure it's going to do me a whole lot of good. I've used it once, and in my mini lathe, I got up about 6,000 RPM. It finally finally settled down like a tire on a car. You know, reach a point to it thing, and then they said in the article that if you took a bull gallop and made a ring around what you would It's $165, and I'll probably still wind up spending 165 when it's over with. Thank you. I have a source of wheels, some movement we'll trees. You want to go to Goodwill and get some inline skates? Use them? Yeah, use them. They cost you two bucks and they have, okay. they have ball bearings. They have ball bearings, yeah. 
I didn't think about that. <coughs> I don't know if that will happen or not. I don't know that the plywood is that good and steady with the base, the way it looks on, but due to the fact that underneath the wave deck where that gripper is running, it's just a little bit small area like it. It's got a real minimum. I've got a couple of things, and some of them are very, very basic, but they've helped me, so I thought they might help you. Uh, in my workshop, uh, if I do, a, I have, to, I have a, a need to make a lot of calculations. For example, if I'm making a small box, I want to make, uh, I may want to take, you know, the, the width and measure and multiply it by 1.6, you know, the golden mean ratio to determine what the length is. If I'm turning a vase, I may want to use the rule of thirds, and I just get tired of calculating all that stuff. So all I did was make a, uh, a laminated sheet, and I just put 12 inches down the left-hand column uh, in one-quarter inch increments, multiplied that number by a third, I multiplied the number by two-thirds, and I multiplied the number by a golden mean, by 1.61. So rather than have to scratch all this out, it's right there. Uh, I've also been doing some, uh, some surveying on a lot that I have. One of my poles is in inches and one of my poles is in meters. So trying to convert from inches to metric and back and forth was a pain in the butt, so I just <coughs> put that on the other side. Uh, it's, it's, it's real easy. It's worked well for me and it might be something that you might want to consider. Cool. Is that yep. a Excel file or what is that? Huh? What is that? I just Excel? built it in an Excel spreadsheet. I mean. Simple enough. Selling those for $40 a piece? That's the $40 piece. <laughs> <laughs> whether, whether you have a gun or not. Uh, this, is, this, is some, this is something I actually stole from Mike Peace. Uh, Mike, had a, Mike had a shop tip in the American uh, Association of Wood Turning. We actually had three or four of them last year. This is one of them. Uh, if, you're, if you've got a small object that you need to transport, I've seen a lot of people wrap them in newspaper. I've seen them wrap them in towels, sheets. Uh, all this is is a pair of sweatpants from Goodwill. Um, you can get six of these out of a pair of sweatpants. Of course, <coughs> you either need to be able to sew or somebody in your family needs to be able to your sew. Your wife's but, uh, machine upstairs. Yeah, well, one of, one of her seven machines upstairs, yeah. yeah. But this, this works <laughs> out real well. And then finally, this is something that uh, I was actually working with Tommy on. Um, and last week, I think Dan uh, had turned the bowl, and one of the last things he did when he turned the bowl was to part the tenon off the back. And when he did that, he held the <coughs> bowl in the chuck with a cold jaw. If you're turning something like this, uh, you also have a tenon on the end when you're finished, but you can't jam that up against the chuck because you'll break it. Uh, you can't hold it in a cold jaw because there's nothing to hold on to. So this is called a reversing bar. Uh, and all the metal pieces, is a, it's a leftover bar from the Beal buffing system. <coughs> uh, you can buy the Beal with three mitts on one bar, which I did and which I really didn't like. So I took the, the, the wheels off and put them on individual uh, bolts and used the same system that Dan used last week. But I had this bar laying around and didn't know, didn't know what to do with it. I almost sold it at the Don Russell picnic, but I'm glad I didn't. But all you do is you just sit this in the, in the hollow form, and you'll see that that automatically centers. Uh, you put it down. You just tighten it up. It just goes over to the lathe. You've got to put some more paper on it. You bring the tailstock up. And once again, it's got a tenon on the end. Uh, turn the tenon off and it's fine. Uh, we had actually, Tommy and I had actually started to try to make one of these out of a three quarter inch uh, threaded rod from Home Depot. Tommy had turned a number two Morse taper on the end. When you put it in, the end of the, uh, I, I guess the three quarter inch round stock at Home Depot is not round. <laughs> so, I, yeah, surprise, surprise. Uh, yeah, and, but this, this works out real well. So, so if you've got a bio buffing system on a bar that you don't need, you, you've got this. I think Peach State is coming out with, or Peach Tree is coming out with uh, their own buffing system. I don't know what it's going to be 
what it's going to cost. But if they got the three wheels on a bar, it's 30 or 40 bucks, buy it, take the wheels off, put it on bolts, and you got a free bar. Peachtree's got one out there that's uh, the brand name on it is Fulton. It does have the bar, it's like $50, $60. It's sitting out there right now. What can I be charged at? Turn it. I can cut an eight by uh, four by eight sheet of plywood in my shop, but it's a little bit tight. So a lot of times I want to set up and do it in the garage on some saw horses. So I wanted some method of doing it. So I purchased a bar stock from here that they had, and I made an adapter for my Makita uh, uh, 18 volt saw. Stick it in there. Made some guidelines for it. So I just sit it down on the board. There's a mark right here, the little white mark there and here. On this side, I mark it to clamp it. Come on this side, clamp it. And of course, it just saws it nice and straight. So that works pretty easy. This here, I needed to uh, make circles one time. And I decided, well, if I'm going to make more than one, I need a jig for it. So I just took a, a strip of bar stock that I had. And what I do is I've got a groove on my sander. So this, of course, could slide in the, in the groove up toward the disc. I made this little bar piece back here so that I can adjust it. I can either put it any position I want and then fine tune an adjustment. The end of this here would push on the uh, bandsaw table and stop. Of course, that relates to what diameter I would have here. And I can make a fine tune adjustment if I want to establish a certain size. And then I just repeat it, just put a screw in the bottom. Just a whole bunch of it at one time with this setting. So that's all that bands? was. Pardon? You said bandsaw, right? I bandsaw a rough circle. With using that jig? No. No. no okay. I just, you said band. You okay. Yeah, I just used the bandsaw to, you know, just to turn a rough circle so I could just put the screw in here, sit it down. Did you tape it on there? Double sided tape or? No. No, so it just because in the there's a screw right there. So how do you hold the uh, yeah. rough blank to that? This here? Yeah. That is the circle I made. <laughs> that is the circle. Oh, I just so put so I just put it. one on there. Oh, okay. So this oh, could okay. be this oh, size, okay. or it could be the oh, okay. the, the center of the circle could oh. be way out. You know, oh, the edge so of the circle could. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the circle problem. itself could oh, be okay. big enough to come out over yeah. top of this. That's why this is all below levels. This could okay. be under the table when I'm yeah. turning yeah. turning a two foot like this to get a circle. Okay. It's still the same pivot point. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah, no, I mean, you can something not like that if, you, if if this was if you attached the square to there, could you not do the same similar thing and using it cut with a bandsaw? Yeah, it's called a circle cutting jig. Yeah, yeah. okay. I never got around to making the circle cutting jig. But I would think that would do the same thing. Yeah. With it might. Feed, you have to have a feed in. You have to feed straight in before you start turning on a bandsaw. Yeah. So this wouldn't yeah. necessarily work unless you somehow combine the two actions. I just haven't got around to building a circle for the band so that's all. Made the, <coughs> excuse me, I made this for the uh, band saw. <laughs> what the heck do they call these things? Paper anyway, paper a fence. Paper it's, paper. it's a fence. Uh, it's uh, was in Woodsmith, volume number 82, if you're interested, and it's, uh, I found, put a scribed line on there on the table because of, uh, you know, the blade doesn't necessarily go cut square. And then you can adjust it using this. To uh, cut veneers, uh, I just I used it very much on those Christmas tree ornaments I did, where I could uh, cut the slabs rather than uh, using a table saw. And I tend to use the band saw more than my table saw because the table saw is getting kind of old. What width is that? Does 
that end up being? What width does that adjustment span? Uh, about right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Inch. You mentioned the scribe on the table, on the top of the table. I've heard several people say about scribing on the top of the uh, saw line, on the top of the table saw, and also band saw. What do you use to scribe that line on the top of the table saw, or any any of the table? Uh, actually, what I'm using, because you change blades periodically, I'll uh, just uh, use a pencil. The next one up is George here. These are very simple items, but uh, <laughs> they do a good job for me. I use a lot of Aileen's Tacky Glue. It comes in a little thing about that big around, about that tall. Of course, the tr trouble with it, I, I, I glue one piece at a time. And if you put glue on it, stand the thing up, when you come back, you gotta shake it down, put another piece on it, so you end up with, with glue all over the table, all over the wall, where you're slinging it like this, trying to get it to come down. With, with this, <coughs> excuse me, with this, I have a, I have a little applicator here that sticks in this hole on, on this side and the, the glue stands up in, in this hole here. And it's open here, so I take a little piece of, I, I usually forget and have to tear it out later, but you put a little piece of wax paper in here because it will occasionally dr drip a little bit. You just take the top off, stick it in here, and turn your glue upside down, and you can take it, use it, put it right back, and you're not shaking it down all the time. So it, it works real good for me. Uh, another thing is, I, I always had my, my cutters and my scissors and my, pencils and my pens and all that stuff strewn all over two or three different uh, tabletops. So I made this and uh, this is nothing but a two by four with a bunch of holes in it. These are coming back for the two by four contest. <laughs> but uh, I had this standing on, standing on one of my uh, tables for a long time against the wall and you just, just line those things up. I took it recently and put it on the back of uh, one of the tables. So I'm, uh, the one I'm working on, where I use my scissors and my pins and so forth the most, this is right on the, screwed onto the back of it. And I just reach over and get those. I always know where, to, most of the time I know where to find them. <laughs> of course, like in the shop, I lay them down and swear somebody must have stolen them and there wasn't anybody else there. <laughs> but, <laughs> so uh, they, they work quite well for me. They may, may, you may get an idea you can use too. This is a 45 degree uh, miter for a table saw. And uh, of course you can set your uh, miter gauge to 45 degrees, but if you're cutting frames, you have to go plus or minus 45, you know. And that might not be exactly 45, but guess what, it doesn't matter as long as you remember to cut <coughs> one side on this side and the other matching edge on the other side. Uh, it could be 43 degrees, because the other one's going to match, regardless. Well, okay, well, so the total is 90. The total is 90, that's right, yeah. Now, this was also used for something else, and that's the reason these pieces are out here, and that was to cut crown molding. Uh, because what you can do is put your crown molding to here and put a spacer, cut a spacer the right size so the crown molding is standing straight up and then just run it through your table saw. Of course you have to have a blade pretty high to do that, you know, so you have to use a little caution with that. <laughs> uh, you might not realize it though, but there's also a block that's covered here so that the saw, run, the blade runs into that block. And you also want to stop so that you don't go all the way through. You know? And I usually just use a clamp or something as a stop you know, on the table so it doesn't go too far. You don't want to cut all the way through. I have another one too. I did not bring it, but it's just a flat piece of wood with two guides on it for my radial arm saw. It's even bigger pain to move your radial arm saw to plus and minus 45 degrees. So you just set it at 90 put that uh, 
flat, and it's just a flat piece with two guides on it on the table, and lock it in, and then you can cut both sides of your frame. I still use a radial arm saw. I know most, a lot of people don't like them, but still works. Uh, very simple. When I'm finishing small things, just a piece of particle board and I drill some holes in it, and these are, uh, of course, are locked in there now. <laughs> just dowels where I uh, sanded one, a sharp edge on one side, and I got a series of holes here so that depending on the size of the piece I'm doing I can move them around and uh, support the piece and then I can spray it and spin it while I'm spraying it to get a more uniform coat especially something like a bowl or or something of that nature you know it's easier to, if you can just spin it around like this what's that about a one inch spacing on them Jerry? roughly I don't remember I think that probably is yeah I wasn't being and by the way, this used to be uh, rectangular, and I found that was, the corners were hitting things too often. <laughs> so I went back and I cut, cut the circle out of it, you know. So that's why there's pieces, uh, holes sticking in the edge here. They were, it was originally a rectangular piece. I found the rounded form worked better though. Ballisters like 200, and uh, you know you have to center the wood before you put it on the lathe. If you make something like this, which is the exact you know four <coughs> inches or six inches, you just line it up. By lining it up, you'll know whether your piece is square or not. Tap it once with this, and you got your, your center done. And it's worth the trouble making it because uh, it's safe centered it real quick. Is that spring loaded? Or? No, it's just uh, I, I, I hit it out with a hammer, and hit it back in again. Um, with my rocking chairs, when I was making rocking chairs, I had a problem. I had to make this cut. This cut had to be a certain certain uh, angle, 17 degrees or 18 or 19. Had to be centered, had to be the correct width. Uh, it was hard enough with this, darn near impossible with something like this. I mean, you know, how do you place it? You know, it's real hard to secure it like this that's way too high. And so it was just a real bear of a problem. So I, uh, I got inspired one night and made this. And uh, <clears throat> basically, what you do is you just you put this in here, and now it's fixed. And I'd strap it in down here and up top here. And the only problem is it did hit the it missed the ceiling by about maybe this much. But anyway, you put it on the table saw and use your fence. And by using the fence of the table saw. Um, I could I could control control it going this way, and uh, I put a little mark, you know, not to cut past a certain thing, and then this I mark these by degrees, and so I'd have three or four of them. This might be 18, and 17, and you know, uh, down. So this way I could control whatever depth I was cutting, and I'd slide it across the router, not the table saw. I had a router that was part of my table saw table, and so the router. Would, would cut this, of course, being at an angle, it was, it was a, a square. Worked very well. So this would be a production jig and accomplish what I wanted. How many passes would you have to go uh, across the bit 
Say again. How many passes across the bit? About four, and uh, I, I measured uh, I measured the uh, you know like it was a quarter inch. So I, uh, on the uh, a fence, I could just move it a quarter inch each time, and I'd have it perfectly. And then sometimes there'd be a little whisker, you know, and I'd just run it through. But it worked pretty well. You know, usually I think when we go to Jigs and Fixers class and look at this uh, turntable, I think, well, we could all use some of that. I'm thinking, I don't think we can use this for No, <laughs> <laughs> this is specialized, and I don't think anybody can use it. That's uh, for that intended purpose. Looks like a big overgrown county. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, what I found is I have as much fun making the jigs as I do the furniture. Yeah. One here. Who's who belongs to this one? And does it have a mate? I did my homework. I went. I read the newsletter. Okay, cool. <laughs> I saw you walking in with. I'm thinking, this is a stranger, and he's got something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you all probably know what that is. That's for adjustable shelving. Before these things were commercially available, I just drilled a series of holes, 32 millimeters apart. I've got my router set up with a bushing with a five millimeter bit that I had to modify on a drill press because it came off of one of those master uh, things that would drill like 90 million holes at once. I had to chuck it in the drill press and round it up so it would chuck into the, uh, the router, which is uh, higher RPMs than, it's, than the, the tool's supposed to be rated for. But you know, it's worked fine for probably 12 years or better now. So you take it's a probably a 5 8 bushing on the router, it drops in these holes, you plunge the router, You've got your shelf hole, and you just uh, you can make these any size as you want. This is for like a base cabinet, and for large bookcases, I have larger ones. And a little jig that has really served its purpose for many years. This is for cutting shims. You've got uh, you can see it starts from zero down to about a quarter inch. Set it on the table saw, put your block of wood in it, and you push both pieces through at the same time. You can cut shims all day. And like I said, on these pieces, sometimes you cut a block and you put a block, but you try to cut it exact to fit down and to snug it up. I just leave myself a little room now and I just take my shims and I knock my shims in and I don't have to fit the block perfectly. And so, I mean, and if you give me a hardwood shim, I can move something. If you give me a hardwood shim and a good size hammer, it's going to go where I want it to go. So, it's pretty handy. Uh, I hardly ever buy door shims anymore, cedar shims. I always make my own shims because they're nice and uniform. I can make them as thick as I want, as long as I want. I get these made up in two by fours and whatever, and like I said, you can knock shims out real quick and, and they're uniform. Assuming these two go together, you <coughs> would belong to this candidate. Three of them. Three of them. Three of them go together, all right. Yeah, my name is Alex, and um, I'm trying to get into um, making boxes. Turn um, the other way, Alex. Go on the other side. Yeah, it's good. Nice. Nice. I'm trying to get into making boxes, and um, I actually I have a two-year project for my niece. I'm supposed to make a box for her. I haven't made it yet, so I'm still making the jigs for it to, in order to create it. <laughs> but um, I'm starting out trying to do the, um, the box with the miter, the miter um, cuts and everything. And one thing I, I wanted to start using is the, um, the table saw sled. So this one is a small one. I have a large one at home. So this one, I figured that um, the, the large one is, is pretty um, cumbersome. Um, it's a lot, you know, pretty bulky and everything like that, trying to slide on a table and setting it up. So this one, I just made a small one. I repurposed um, a, um, what is that, a, a shelving part from a, a, a desktop or whatever. And um, so I could put my small pieces in there and slice it up. Everything. I'm, I'm going to make another one so I could use, um, um, put the, the saw blade at a 45 degree angle. This one is for, is for 90 degrees, a straight cut, so I could cut the, the pieces at 90 degrees and put it on a table and everything. And now for your boxes, normally when you make a mitre box, they're not very strong and they're not very um, aesthetic, it's aesthetically pleasing. So what you do is you, you need to probably put a spline in there or I'm also trying to do um, other types of cuts like the, um, the dovetail cuts and things like that, so I'm working on that. But the one I want to do right now is actually do a spline cut where I do like just a slice in here, um, the width of the, um, the, um, the, the table saw blade. And then after that, put like small pieces like the um, maybe purple, um, purple, 
Purple Heart um, cuts in there. So to do that, you actually need a spline cutting jig. Um, so this one would actually sit in, in my table saw. And I would have the um, box sit in here on there. And you just slide it on the uh, table saw. And, you know, the, the saw blade would cut right in there. And you raise it up in order to cut the, um, the curve in, into, the, into the box. Um, this one is a little different than the other one. I saw online, I Google like a lot of different um, um, designs and everything online. This one has an adjustable um, clamping system where I could actually move the box at different parts and cut the spline in different parts of the box. And it'll register, I'll, I'll put these clamps in here and just register it so I can slide the box in, hold it in place safely, and um, slide and put each of the cuts in there. And for each time I, I, I put a cut, so it'll just slide in there and cut on one side. And, and for each each of the each for each of the sides and everything like that, mm -hmm. and also there's two clamps so it'll sort of hold it in place. The back of it has a little safety part in there. I just put a block of wood so that when the saw blade actually finishes, it'll it'll stop in there so I won't you know get cut or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And also the same thing with the um, the the sled also. Just put a little block in there so when you finish the cut, it it sits right into the block of wood, so you don't have to see the blade or get cut or anything like that. And I'm thinking about doing other variations because I've seen they've done um, 45 degree cuts and other different angle cuts. But right now I'm just going to do just a 90 degree um, cut and see how that, that, that works out. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. My name is Rob Sheffield. Uh, one of my passions is segmented wood turning. And uh, one of the things that turners need to do is to prep a log for a blank. And uh, a good way to, to uh, cut off a, a log is on the, uh, the bandsaw. But you don't want to lay a, a log on a bandsaw surface because it gets pretty wild quickly. So I made this little <laughs> jig here that, uh, that helps me to do that. But one, one of the features on this is that you can adjust the jaws in and out to fit different logs. Um, I've got an 18-inch bandsaw on this. I, can, I think it has about 11 inches between the top and the tabletop, and you can, you can put a pretty good-sized log in this thing, or a small <laughs> one as well. And You just put it in there, and you hold it down with your hands and run it through, and you can get a nice straight cut off and cut different uh, lengths of the, of the log if you want to. Uh, do some end turning, end grain turning. You can then flip the log up on its flat side and cut it in half and get your bolt blanks. Um, so I use that quite a bit. In segmented turning, uh, one of the main objectives is to cut these little pie shaped pieces of wood and then glue them together and, and uh, make consecutive rings that. Uh, are a little bit larger in diameter, and you can construct your your bowl out of that. I'll pass this around for folks who may have never seen them. But um, those the the ends of them will be trued up on a disc sander and then glued together and flattened so that you can glue them. But to get started, you got to have a jig or something that's going to cut those pie-shaped pieces of wood, and, and it needs to be fairly accurate. If not, when you glue them together, the the, the face of it, of the half ring, can be pretty pretty much, uh, it, they need to be parallel or it won't glue together properly. So uh, Kevin Neely is a uh, uh, pretty renowned segmented wood turner and, and uh, on his site he's got quite a number of jigs to, that assist in that endeavor and, and one of them is a miter sled. And this, this uh, is used on the table saw. You can cut segmented pieces on the table saw or you can cut them on the miter uh, compound miter saw I think Don Russell was in here a couple of or a year or so ago and he was doing some Christmas ornaments and he did his on the on a compound miter saw um, but this this is designed to be used on a table saw and my objective uh, improvements I guess you could say over Kevin Neely's design is that my 
bar here is adjustable and my stop is adjustable as well. <coughs> and now, now his is, but it's a little bit tough to work with and I wanted something that was easy to, um, to do. So the MDF base is, uh, MDF, the beauty of it is it's cheap, number one, and, and number two, it's very stable. So again, these, these uh, pieces need to be cut accurately and if, if there's any type of flex or something in your base, it's going to impact the, the dimension of the piece. So the, this top piece up here was uh, to help keep the MDF flat as well as this bottom and it has proven to be useful to push the sled back and forth. And, um, I've got this arch up here to clear the, uh, the top of the, uh, the blade. So the way it works is that you just adjust this angle here. I use a dial bevel protractor, a, uh, a, a digital protractor. Wixie makes makes it here, and, and uh, they sell it. They sell it here. I think I would like to have that more than the dial. It's a little bit easier to see, and, and you kind of a little bit of a guesswork initially with the dial bevel protractor. But set it up against your uh, your blade, and you can get your angle here and. And uh, set that in, and then this you just loosen it and go back and forth to get the uh, the dimension or the length of your segmented piece, and it's pretty easy just to lock it down, and away you go. Um, one of the things you can make these things to fit any any saw, and this is probably common knowledge to a lot of folks, but um, I have a, a rigid saw, and basically what I did was I set my fence on my table saw so that this would drop down on the surface of the saw and the blade would come up and dissect this little arch right here and then once I had that set I locked the fence in put these uh, these tracks face down shimmed them up a little bit so they were proud of the surface of the saw put some double sided tape on there and then all you got to do is drop this thing down up against your fence lift it straight out and you're and your guides are perfectly set for your, your particular um, saw. Oh. And then you screw them in, then screw them in. Then screw them in. Exactly, yeah. That's it. Don't, don't, don't you cut into your uh, guide when you're cutting, you know, past the end a little bit? Yes, so you that's do. that's a fresh guide you got on there then? No, it's not. As a matter of fact, it's the guide that, uh, that uh, I made when I made this jig. Um, and that was what I do is I just put a piece of waste stock in front of this thing and try oh, to keep okay. it okay. such that I don't nibble away at this. But don't that throw you know, your accuracy off? I'm sorry. Don't that throw your accuracy off of that? Bit if if you've got a good good piece of waste stock on there, you don't want to just <laughs> like, you don't want to just have some you know wild piece of plywood or something like that. Good piece of stock that'll that'll be nice and square and. and MDF, uh, another thing I found, MDF is, uh, uh, this, these are MDF, and if you, if you finish, put any kind of finish on MDF, the, the end fibers will stand up. And, and so what I found is that you can take a little, like a drink cup, pour a little glue in it, a couple of drops of water, and get you a brush. Paint it on that MDF, and after a couple hours it'll dry, and get a, a little block sanding, do two, three times. And that edge of that MDF is really nice, and, and that's all this is. It's nice and square and works real well. That's it. Yeah, thank you, sir. I'll uh, take the opportunity of his jig uh, being up here to, to pass along a uh, bit of information to you that I learned the hard way. I had a uh, similar sort of sled that I was making, and what I did with, uh, with the sled I was making was I was embedding a piece of T-Track in it, kind of like this, and before I could cut the slot in there, I decided, well, I need to know where that, where that blade is going to come in contact. So uh, I thought to myself, well, okay. Because what I was going to do is I was going to slice a section out of it to make a, a clearance for the blade. So I had the, the uh, T-Track embedded in there, screwed down, everything is cool. So I got my hands here like this. 
I proceed to slide the thing across the saw stop. As soon as the blade on the saw stop saw this piece of aluminum, even though my hands weren't touching it, there was enough of a capacitive discharge on there, the module fired, and God, let me tell you how quiet it gets. <laughs> I thought, what went wrong? <laughs> then was when I figured out how sensitive those things are. So we uh, proceeded to have a new trophy to hang on the wall then for yet another example of uh, what a saw stop will do. Okay, uh, now that we come to the point about, uh, let's have a, a drawing here for these these raffle tickets. Uh, yes, sir. Before you draw, uh, get the drawing, could you get a picture of every one of those jigs before it gets away today? I've, I've already done so. Oh, no. <laughs> I was taking pictures of, as they were demonstrating, I'm but I will. I'm video recording also. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I've got sleds too, and after a couple near misses, I had some old <clears throat> draw handles, and I screwed them on top of that sled so that I automatically grabbed those instead of randomly along that. Nice, nice place for it. Nice, safe place for my hands to be. To keep my hands out of the way of the saw. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, what is that jig that you just had? I think it belongs to... It's part of the... That, that, that goes along with that, the Bikita saw guy? Yeah. Okay. I bought the stock right here at the store. They cut it to the window. I also bought the eight foot to go the other way. Uh, before we do that, and since Hans walked up here at the, uh, the opportune time to remind me, uh, next weekend, uh, when I show the, uh, the deal about the, uh, the vacuum press, the vacuum pumps, and so forth, uh, after that class, starting at, what will it be, about 10 or... 10 or 15 minutes after, we're yeah, having our scroll saw fellowship, yep. but part of it we're going to do using the scroll saw and some of it, we're going to be using the vacuum press to make some marquetry. Extension of our program that we had on Monday night. And we're also going to be doing other scroll saw stuff, but if anybody wants to stay and do it, because when we get done, if the two of us work our thing right, we're going to also try to, if everybody, it's not one of these ones where you're going to be doing like you're doing right now and sit in your chair and watch us do it you're going to physically partake of it and take a little something home. So you've done the, all the operations. It may not be exactly what you want, but you'll be able to take it home, and that should be able to expand anything you want to do. So that's what we're going to try to That's what two of us are going to try to do on Saturday, next Saturday. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask if, <clears throat> does anyone know how to change, easily change, the tires on a bandsaw? I, I already done it, but um, if I have to do it again, I got enough nicks and cuts on it that I'd like a much easier way. That is a part of a job. Does anyone know any easy way of doing it? Buy a new band saw? The water trick works fine for uh, in the video. Heat, heat, heat them up with in hot water. Mm -hmm. Man, I tell you, there's still a lot of pulling and, and nicking on your fingers. But did you use dowels? Use um, hair dowels. Dowels work probably as good, but it's still a lot. Of, okay. Mm. I, I have the marks, the war marks of, of doing it. I think you just need to have a fellowship at your house with four or five people you think might do it, and then say, "Oh, by the way, fellas, can you help me with this?" <laughs> good.